If you will, open your Bibles to Malachi. Malachi chapter 3 is where we'll be exploring this morning. Again, what we've been doing with the Minor Prophets is, uh, is like a 30,000 foot view of the entire book. And it's, it is difficult to go through verse by verse in just a, um, a half hour or so. Yes, 30 minutes from, from now or so, yes. So if you will, listen quickly as I speak quickly. So we're there in our uh, Bibles to Malachi. If you're not sure where it is, find the more or less the center of your Bible where the Old and the New Testament meet and turn back just a couple of pages. Uh, unless you have a very old 1611 King James Bible that still had the Apocrypha in the middle, you may have to change and go back a few more books where those intertestament uh, books are found. So you have to, if you're wondering what those are, that's another conversation for another day. But uh, some of the old Bibles, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, Bible, the early King James Bible, they all had intertestamental history books uh, in between them. Uh, they did not pass the test of canon, so that's why they are not in our Bibles today. Again, another question for another day. But here we are in Malachi. What are, what are, the, what are some thoughts that uh, we can learn and glean from? What are some principles that we can appreciate from Malachi? Is it just another one of those prophetic books that was written for Israel 2,400 years ago and it's not really relevant for today? Is that what this is? Not at all. God's word is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So whatever we read in the Old Testament is practical for us today. Whatever we read in the New Testament is still just as practical as the time that the Holy Spirit inspired it. So this book, to put it in its place, to put it in its context, is the very last writing that God would have for his people before going silent for 400 years. God didn't have an ounce of prophecy. There were no more prophets on the earth. Not until John the Baptist was born by Zechariah, not the Zechariah we studied a few weeks ago, but to another man by the name of Zechariah, that God had come to him, come to his parents and said, he will be the forerunner for the Messiah. John the Baptist himself says that he's not the Messiah. He is the simple uh, testimony of the Messiah to come. And he was proclaiming, as we will observe here in Malachi chapter 3, of the Jesus to come. <clears throat> so we end in Malachi chapter 3. One of the last verses in chapter 4 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. So a type of Elijah. This is typology here. A type of one to come. Not This isn't talking about... Christ. This is talking about the prophet who's going to proclaim the Messiah to come. This is a prophecy of John the Baptist. Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's talking about Jesus. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So here God is prophesying that the last time he wrote says that a, Messiah, that a prophet will come and proclaim the Messiah and then in Mark chapter 1, we pick up that exact same story. So with that in mind, also <clears throat> on the back bullet or on the back tables and maybe on the tables as you came in or one of our helpful greeters, what I would like to do, do with you, church, is I would like to have a Bible reading program with you. And so pick one of these up on your way out if you haven't already picked one up. And just want to talk about it for just a, a quick second. Obviously, you, I don't expect you to read that. I'm just illustrating for you what's before you. And so what this is, it's five by five by five. It's five minutes a day. It would take you to just read one chapter. Five days a week, so you get two days off, one on Sunday, and we'll take your day, whatever it might be, throughout the week. And just determine that you're going to spend five minutes. You say, well, I already spend time in prayer and Bible reading. That's great. Amazing. I love that. But this is for also for everyone else. You may say, I don't have five minutes a day. <clears throat> if that's your uh, uh, conversation, if that's your excuse, I would like for you to break up your 24-hour day into five-minute increments. Can you do that? If you say, I don't have five minutes a day, uh, every hour break up into five, five minutes. You say, well, this is going to be a lot of work. And now uh, on the line right next to it, 
determine what you do for those, every one of those five minutes throughout the day. And you say, okay, I have five minutes here, I have five minutes there. Well, take one of those blocks and spend some time in Bible reading. The very first uh, Bible reading that you're going to encounter is in the book of Mark. And it's week one, it's day one, so tomorrow. And so what the blank line is for is for you to write maybe the big idea. So for the last 12 weeks, you and I have been looking at the big idea of the prophets. Now we're going to make a smaller passage, just one chapter, and I would like for you to come up with a big idea. So I'm going to give you a hint for tomorrow. Mark chapter 1 is about preparation. Preparation. If you read through the beginnings of Mark chapter 1, we we see that uh, that John the Baptist comes on the scene. We see that Jesus starts calling his disciples. Disciples. He's preparing them for three years of ministry. So preparation, that's kind of the big idea of Mark chapter 1. You may, you may come up with something totally different. That's great. Uh, you may, uh, some, uh, uh, an account that comes up, maybe healing when uh, Jesus heals many. Maybe that's the big idea that you get from, from this chapter. Again, I don't expect for all of us to have the same big idea. Uh, the Lord, again, uh, uses the Word of God differently in each of our lives. That's why it is, it's an alive book and it speaks to one of us differently. Maybe the temptation of Jesus really sticks out on you. So write that down. Whatever it might be, keep this with your Bible and as you look back, maybe you skip a day and oh man, I missed that. That's okay. Pick up with the next, next day. Pick up with the next chapter. Just get some scripture reading behind you. And uh, so when we think of, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) sorry about that. Uh, When we think of scripture, we think of how timely and lively it is. It can only be that if we get into it. So I just wanted to challenge you. So that's what this Bible reading plan is. Um, I know that many times we try to uh, do a Bible in a year and we get to Leviticus and Numbers and we just get wore out and we, ah, I'm just going to skip that. I'll pick up whenever it's back in Psalms or Proverbs. I don't want you to do that. I want you to, to get a plan, stick with it. And then get God's word under your belt and and to dig deep in it. And then there's some other ideas as well uh, here on the front of this to give you some uh, further instruction, further ideas. So take that tool. It was uh, done by Navigator's Discipleship Tool. It's freely free to distribute. It's meant to copy. It's meant to get out there because they're just trying to provide for you a tool for you to read God's word. You say, I'm on the road all the time. Get an audio book. Get an audio version of scripture. There's many out there, many different apps. And uh, that's another great way to to get some scripture as you're uh, driving and to uh, hear these stories be read to you. So just wanted to encourage you with that before we begin. So when we come to Malachi now, let's jump back to Malachi chapter 3. And we think of this entire book, uh, what is the big idea? When we think of the big idea of this entire book, what are our thoughts? Well, the big idea, I believe, is that this book emphasizes the importance of maintaining a sincere relationship with God, honoring Him in worship and staying true to the covenant. And that's something that the, uh, that the Jewish people were struggling with. They were not having a sincere relationship with God. You remember the time frame of when this book was written. They've already experienced their 70 years in captivity. God has brought them along. And now they are here. They're back in the land. The temple is being rebuilt. It's known as Zerubbabel's temple under uh, Nehemiah helped them rebuild the wall. Ezra helped them rebuild the temple. Haggai that we looked at uh, a couple weeks ago last week, uh, we we observed him uh, furthering, instructing them to build the temple. You know, he said that you live in these wonderful homes, but yet God's home is in disarray and it's in destruction. And so the big idea now of Malachi is to maintain that relationship with God, because how easy is it? 
for us in our maintenance mode with Christ that we fall short. Go ahead. Go two years without maintaining your car. Go a year. Uh, you may say, I don't drive that much. I don't put 5,000, 10,000 miles on it. But, okay, take that over a course of many years. You take it to the mechanic. He, he pulls the oil plug, and maybe nothing comes out. And that's not a good thing. Or maybe this giant sludge comes out. And that's neither a good thing either. So go ahead. Don't maintenance your vehicles for some time. And so that's what was happening with the Jewish people. They were not maintaining. They were just living the status quo. And so how dangerous that is. And Malachi comes on the scene and says, stop. Stop doing just the status quo. You need to have a sincere relationship with God. You need to honor him in true worship. Stop worshiping self. Stop worshiping idols. Stop giving credit where God has brought you back out of that captivity and stay true to the covenant. So when you and I end a year 2023, oftentimes we look back and say, well, this was a great year in this aspect, but other things, not so much. We're just going to leave that in 2023. And moving into 2024, I'm going to take this with me, and I'm looking forward to this in the coming year. I'm looking forward to growing this way in the coming year. And so that's what Malachi was doing. He was saying, this is what has happened, and this is what is to come. The Messiah is going to come. Be ready, people. Many, many generations pass before the Messiah does come. But again, this is the book, one of the books that the people of Israel had during those 400 silent years. And they were just looking forward to that day. Some were, others were, he's not coming. The Messiah is not coming. And that's why you can see that when Jesus does come on the scene and he begins to do miracles, he begins to fulfill scripture, and they are looking, saying, that's not the Messiah that was prophesied. The Messiah that was prophesied was supposed to be wonderful, counselor, the prince of peace. He's supposed to be royalty. And you're the carpenter's son. You're not the Messiah. Because they were looking for something different. They were not true to God's word. They were not maintaining their relationship with him. And so we ask this question, how does Malachi fit into God's story? What's happened before? We, we talked about this before. The temple was rebuilt. The hearts of the Jews were still cold to the things of God. Just because they had a place to worship did not mean that their hearts were in on it. They were just had this superficial worship. They just had this this idea of that's what church is supposed to be. The idea of that's what temple worship is supposed to be. They had it, but they were not sincere. And Malachi comes on the scene to tell them that their religious rituals led to hard-heartedness toward God and departure from his law. They just thought, well, if I just continue to do this thing religiously, and if I continue to obey in this one aspect, whereas all these other ones, I mean, God can't have those. I mean, I'm going to keep those. But in this one thing, go into the temple. Ah, I can check that box. I'll just keep doing this religiously and participating in these r religious rituals. But I'm not going to give God my heart. Remember the prophet Joel? This is probably a few months ago now, a couple months ago, and where, where God says, I would rather you rend your heart than to rip your garments. Because when they would confess their sin, when they'd be in mourning, they would, they would rip their garments and they would put ash on their, on their head. They would put ash on them as a symbol of mourning. But oftentimes they were doing that as a religious ritual. God says, I don't want you to do that. I would rather you rend your heart, rip your heart for me than do this outward sign of worship. And again, Malachi has that same message. And then lastly, Malachi delivered God's message of judgment as well as prophesying that the Messiah would be revealed. And it's found here in the, in the pages. We already read Malachi chapter 4, but Malachi chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. An exciting day to come. Malachi fitting into God's story. How does Malachi now fit into my story? What benefit can, can I see from Malachi? Oftentimes we, uh, we, uh, leave, oftentimes we leave our first love and forget what God has done for us. The book of Revelation tells us about it. Ephesus. You remember when we studied Ephesians for the last nine months earlier this year? Well, they left their first love. God had some things against them. Jesus says, but 
I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So we do the same thing. The Jewish people did the same thing. They left their first love. They left God and said, we don't need him. We have other things to press for. And church, we cannot let that happen in the year to come. You say, well, you look back on 2023 and says, well, I left God there. I I shouldn't have, I should have had more faith through that circumstance, through that trial. And I'm gonna need God's help moving into the future. So let Malachi help you with that. Don't leave your first love as the Jewish people did or as that church in Ephesus did stay true to the Lord secondly God reminds us over and over of his unfailing love and promises the psalmist says in Psalm 143 let me hear of your unfailing love each morning for I am trusting you show me where to walk for I give myself to you beautiful way to describe our walk with God. God, help me through these trials. Help me through these circumstances. Help me, Lord, to not fall like the people did in the days of Malachi, but rather lift me and strengthen me through it. Lift me to that task. And then thirdly, God's loving relationship is not maintained through formal rituals, no matter how hard we try. That's what they were trying to do in Malachi's day. And Malachi is saying, don't do that. That's not what God wants you to do. You are robbing God because you're keeping back things when they rightfully belong to him and you're worshiping them rather than giving them over to the Lord. So when we think of worship and giving, when when, uh, Caleb read that passage earlier about robbing God, what's that talking about? Well, they're keeping back. They're not giving to God what rightfully belongs belongs to him, whether that's of time or finances or, or uh, your loving spirit or whatever it might be. You say, well, uh, this is, belongs to me. This is my faith. Are you not told in scripture to go therefore and preach to all nations, helping them understand the gospel? Or are you robbing God of that? So how does Malachi fit into my story? Those three ways we can apply this book to ourselves. And then some of the key verses we'll be exploring today. So you're there in Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. We already read verses 1 through 12. So I'm not going to reread all of them, but I want to call to your attention just a couple of them. So how do we undergo this refining? How do we take from what we learned in 2023, looking forward into 2024, how do we renew our spirit, refine our spirit for the coming year. The first way for us to do that is a call to repentance. You've heard me say this over and over and over again. The last 12 weeks, repentance, I think, has come up every single week. And you may say, well, I'm tired of hearing that word. I don't know even what that even means. So I came up with a little acrostic for you to maybe help you understand and to realize what repentance means. So a lot of times, I don't know about you, But for me, sometimes when a driver is doing very bad driving skills, it upsets you. So when you're in your car, think of repentance because sometimes the way we act towards them, we need to repent of that. So whether or not that helps you, so be it. But just remember car. The first way for us to repent is to confess our sin. Confess our sin. Jesus says, Throughout the Gospels, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. We hear that. So how do we do that? Well, first, we confess our sin. How did the the psalmist confess his sin? Well, he says in Psalm 51, verse 4, against you, this is David speaking to God, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. You say, well, I didn't sin against God when I was a bad driver. I I sinned against that person. I cut him off. I yelled at him. I screamed at him. Well, that's one of God's creations. So when you've done that to that person, you've sinned against God and you need to confess your sin to God. Confess your sin. Secondly, ask for God's mercy. Ask for God's 
mercy. The passage that I have for you is Hebrews chapter 9. It looks like the bottom was cut off, but it says this, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The context of that, of that passage is talking about how the Old Testament way of sacrificing, they had to sacrifice uh, over and over and over again to confess their sin, to ask for God's mercy, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. But then Jesus came. Jesus came in the Gospels and, and he fulfilled the Old Testament. He is the one who was sufficient to pay the penalty for all sin, both past, present, and future. And so we go to the Lord and plead for God's mercy. But it began with confessing sin. It secondly moved on to asking for God's mercy. And then the other part of repentance is refrain and obey. The idea of repentance is you're heading this direction. Repentance is turning and going a new direction. You're refraining from that thing. You're obeying what's before you, not what's behind you. Ask God to break you and to heal you. Accept that painful process of confronting and repenting from sin because it's not easy. It is painful. It does hurt, but it's for your benefit because it's for God's glory. Understanding that we need to grieve over sin. We need to rejoice in our salvation. Rejoice in that mercy that we've received from the Lord because we've asked of him. We need to cultivate, we need to grow true repentance and a heart committed to obedience. The psalmist did in Psalm 51 Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit that I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. When we have that repentant heart and we look to others and not that we're judging them and accusing them and ridiculing them, but we're, we get the opportunity to teach them and say, I, I have sinned. This is how I've turned. Now come with me. Join me in this journey. I know that you're struggling in this way. So I'm here to teach God's ways and sinners will return to you. That's a mark of a repentant heart. Uh, when you're a teacher, you really know the things. When you're a student, you're struggling through, maybe you're, you're struggling with algebra and you just have no idea about it. Uh, but Mrs. Bennett, she would know how to teach you because she's, she's really helped with that. She's really mastered that particular subject. She's a math teacher. So when you're a teacher, you know your things. You know what, what you've been taught. And you've been able to replay it and you've been able to calculate all these things so when you and I when we conquer when we when we uh, refrain from sin we become uh, the, the, we have that ability to uh, teach others to uh, guide others to pray for others on their journey we refrain and obey just as the psalmist says then I will teach transgressors your ways but only after that repentant heart so if we would like this purification process, this refining process, we need to understand we need to have a repentant heart. Secondly, uh, if we want to renew and refine, we begin this refining and purification process. Look with me in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. We already read the first verse. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. There's fire to burn off the dross and soap to whiten. This is an indication of a true condition of our hearts. If the fire will burn off the iniquity, the soap then comes to wash out the stain of sin. 1 Peter 1 verse 7, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, might be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're refined. God is bringing us through this refining fire. But then this renewing part happens. This purification part happens. In Psalm 51, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. 
again, first to begin with a repentant heart, and then we're turning, we're saying, God, cleanse me, wash me, help me down this journey. I keep sinning against you, and I don't want to stay in that state. I'm in this repentant state. I'm moving towards you. Purge me and help me. Clean me up. 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's never easy going through hardships. It's never easy to endure the stresses of life. But when you look back to 2023, embrace God's refining work. Embrace the things that God has done to you this past year to push you forward into year to come so that you can be purged, you can be purified along with God's help. And only through the Lord can you achieve this refining and purification process as Malachi is teaching. Thirdly, as we continue through, uh, as we look back to 2023 and as Malachi is teaching the people here, he says to remember God's faithfulness. Highlight God's unchanging nature from, tw- uh, from the year of 2023. Malachi says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. For I, the Lord, do not change. What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that, God? You, you, you don't change? I, I thought over and over you changed. The Lord does not change. The Lord uh, is not slack concerning his promises. Uh, the Lord is faithful. Not the Lord was faithful. We shouldn't use that past tense word. No, the Lord is faithful. Great is your faithfulness as uh, as um, Jeremiah laments in Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, says Jeremiah. God was faithful in 2023, and God will continue to be faithful in 2024. In 2023, I have a blank there. What is one moment from 2023 that showed how faithful God was to you? Think of some things. Record that. Write that down here. Maybe uh, you say, I can't think of anything right now. Take this with you, and at some point today or some point this week, write down how was God faithful to you in 2023. Remember that. Remember God's faithfulness fa- faithfulness number 4 renewal of your covenant and commitment as the the uh, israelites as uh, the people of judah were supposed to do they're supposed to renew what god has done for them and then commit into the years to come as the temple was being rebuilt god is is telling them about his covenant with them and restoring relationships with them and so it is even with us in 2023 into 2024 to renew and to return we could say the seventh verse of our chapter Malachi 3 from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them then God says return to me and I will return to you says the Lord of hosts return Return back to him. You say, in 2023, I started straying from God. I started going this way. I started going this that way. And I just wasn't as close to God as I once was. And I have a desire to get back with God. I have a desire to strengthen my relationship with God. Or you may say, I never had a relationship with God in 2023 or 2022 or years and years ago. I've, I've never experienced that. I've never had that time with God today is a new day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is a time for you to repent of your sin, turn to God, believe in him, trust in him, and know that he is a loving and gracious father. Renew that spirit. Renew that covenant and that commitment with the Lord. And God is reminding his people here that you're cursed with a curse because you've, you've never uh, had that true obedience to me. You were just doing these things superficially. 
And uh, unlike uh, the Jews here in this time, we have the opportunity to repent and to restore and to renew our covenant with God. They did not do that, but we have an opportunity to do that. God is teaching us the same way as he was teaching them to renew our commitment to the Lord. And then lastly, as we close, I would like for you to turn to just two more passages. I would like to reference the one I have in your handout here in just a moment, but I want you to look at Malachi chapter 4. At the very beginning of the message, I brought this out, but I would like for you to see it for yourself. This redirecting hearts. Redirecting hearts. It says in Malachi chapter 4, in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So here the heart is beginning to turn. Uh, how is it turned? We'll now enter the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1. It says this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So the Old Testament ends with a prophecy of John the Baptist to come. The New Testament begins with this quote from Isaiah because Isaiah even prophesied of John the Baptist to come as well. We have the prophecy uh, stated in Malachi and then we have a prophecy, the prophecy fulfilled in the Gospels. Isn't that neat? Isn't that so cool to see how Scripture, even though 400 years pass, how they connect, how, how they just interact with one another. Why? Because God is the author of this book. It wasn't just written by some man spewing out story after story. No, God said all Scripture is given by inspiration. So God can see the past, the present, and the future. He knew of what was to come. And he reminds his people to redirect their hearts, direct them back to him because the Lord Jesus is coming. Same it is with us today. We know that the Lord is coming. It's prophesied that he will come again as he came here in the, in the first time in the Gospels. We, too, need to redirect our hearts, direct our hearts to God and say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done before. Help me now to make my path straight. Help me to direct my life towards you. Your way is better than my way, and I need your help. Psalm 119, verse 10, I have on your handout. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Make your path straight. Direct your heart to the Lord, and he will help you to be renewed and to be refined in the year to come. Church, will you stand with me as we close in prayer? We're going to close by singing the song, Jesus Paid It All. He did that for you. You say, I've never received Christ. I don't know who he is. I want a personal relationship with him. He is the one that paid for your sin. Confess your sin. Come to him. Believe in him. And as, the, as John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave, accept Jesus as that payment for your sin. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he paid it all for us, for me. And Lord, we pray that everyone in the sound of my voice may know of that love, that love of Jesus. And Lord, help us to look back on 2023 with thankfulness and gratitude, but help us to push forward in 2024 with a renewed heart and redirect our hearts back to you, we pray in Jesus' name.
Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone. Can change the leprous hearts and melt the heart of soul. Jesus paid it all. Father, as we come into a new year, let us bring the hope of Jesus, the hope of eternal life, the hope of serving a never-changing God, that we would want to serve you and honor you and glorify your name. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week. See you next year. Ah.